All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Milwaukee City Hall for today's public records training. We have, uh, we have with us folks from the State Archives and the Public Records Advocate here with us today. A few housekeeping items for those in the room. Restrooms are downstairs. Please sign in in the hallway. Also, if you're watching online, please be sure to uh, email Ginger to make sure we can capture that you are participating in the, in the training. So, um, We'll hear from, uh, first we'll hear from Matt Brown with the State Archives. He's been with the State Archives for 14 years and he'll talk about uh, records retention. After Matt, we'll hear from our new public records advocate, uh, Ginger McCall, who was appointed by the governor earlier this year. She'll talk to how to respond to public records requests. And for those in the room, uh, please feel free. We'll, we'll take, uh, Ginger and Matt will take questions throughout the event. I'll have a handheld mic. We'll just wanna make sure you cap, your question gets captured on the mic because we're recording this and it'll be available on the city's YouTube channel uh, afterwards. Uh, and if you're watching live uh, and you wanna email a question, you can email Ginger and we'll try to see if we can't get your question answered during the session. So with that, welcome to Milwaukee and I give you Matt Brown. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I am here from Secretary of State Archives Division, AKA the Oregon State Archives. And today we're gonna be talking about public records retention and public records law basics at, when it relates to records retention. So we're gonna walk through what is a public record, um, and also, what are your responsibilities for managing public records and the best methods for retaining them uh, to comply with the law? All right, so at State Archives, we have a couple main functions. The first one is we run the reference room where the permanent records of Oregon State government are preserved and made, made accessible. We also have the publications unit, which publishes the Oregon Blue Book and the Oregon Administrative Rules. And then there's my unit, records management, where we provide advice and assistance to agencies on request about how to keep records. And we also spend a lot of our time these days with our electronic records management system project. It's called ORMS, and it automates a lot of these retention and records destruction issues that we'll be talking about today. All right, a couple quick slides to give you the, the foundation of public records law in Oregon. Straight to the statute, ORS 192. Defines public record. Um, it has changed in the last several years. Our definition of public record used to be a laundry list of different types of records or formats or storage media for records. Nowadays, it's a more generic um, definition that you want things to meet all three of these conditions listed in the law for something to be considered a public record for the purposes of retention. So first of all, it um, something needs to be in the possession of or created or received by a public agency. And that could be a state agency, a local agency, cities, special districts, pretty much any entity that uh, gets taxpayer dollars. So part A is basically does it exist in some tangible format that you can see or touch. Part B, is this information public, public related, related to an agency's ability to fulfill its public function? And part C, does it have some, uh, is it necessary to satisfy some kind of requirement or need of the public agency? We don't retain records or documents that don't have, fulfill some kind of need for our, for our agency, that don't help us do our jobs. And then also at the bottom of the slide, the technology or medium that information is held in at this moment is irrelevant to whether it's considered a public record or not. Formats are very changeable. If it's in paper form, you can slap it on a scanner and make it electronic or vice versa, you can print out something. The, as long as the information itself isn't changed, the retention will be the same regardless of what form or format or storage media it happens to be in at that moment. So again, something would have to meet all three of these criteria listed on this slide to be considered a public record. So the public records law applies to Public, public related work done anywhere, in any physical location, on any type of account, uh, 
whether that's a personal account, work account, a device kept at home, a device that you bought with your own money, all of those devices can and sometimes do hold public records. So um, that's why we avoid commingling our, our work with our personal information whenever possible, because those kinds of things that end up in a work account or on your work calendar technically could be requested and made accessible to the public. Uh, there are exemptions to, to types of information that can be disclosed, and Ginger will be talking about that more in her, her talk. So again, whether we decide something is a public record or not, it has nothing to do with the technology or format that it's in right now. It's only content that matters. Whether the content relates to a public employee uh, or pu fulfilling a public function of government. Um, and also, you want to avoid using personal email accounts for work and vice versa, probably, to keep, keep yourself and your agency uh, out of trouble. The content is what drives retention and access requirements to public records. So we've decided what is a public record. And does every public record need to be kept forever? Luckily, the answer is no. The courts have realized that no public agency has the resources to keep every scrap of information indefinitely. And so that's where a records retention schedule comes in. We just call them schedules. So a schedule is a list of records and tells you how long you have to keep them. In some cases, it will describe the types of records that might be included under that entry. And it will have, uh, hopefully, a nice, clean, concise, easy to follow retention period uh, after it so that you know when you can destroy records that fall under that category. So your retention schedule is the only legal authorization that you need to destroy public records. You don't have to have to get local approval, or if you work with a federal agency, you don't have to get their approval. Our Secretary of State uh, retention schedules should encompass all of those varying requirements and make them, put them in a nice easy package so that you can follow them and know when your records can be destroyed. When we write a retention schedule, we always work in collaboration with the regulated agencies to get their input because our knowledge of records held by a city, for example, are pretty much a mile wide and an inch deep. We don't work with those records on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't know the city's uh, detailed requirements for keeping them, and so that's why we want regulated agencies to weigh in to help us issue these retention schedules so that they can be signed off on uh, not only by state archives, but by a, a committee of uh, agencies affected. We do take into account four categories of possible record value, and those are administrative, which is just business need, how long you need information to do your job. Legal need, in that case, possibly the courts or the legislature have weighed in on how long records need to be kept. Fiscal, and that just means audit value. Our auditor is going to be requesting accounting records, for example. And for how long will they be requesting them? How far back? And finally, historical requirements. So we, we weigh those um, different types of requirements and needs, and in collaboration with, in this case, the cities, write a retention schedule that will comply with all of those requirements. The schedules are signed off by, like I said, committees and by the state archives before they're valid. They are on a, a review cycle so that we're so the schedules are dynamic. They do change because cities change and their missions and the records that document those missions also change. And then finally, the city schedule can be found. We usually just have people Google the phrase OAR-166, and that'll take you to a list of general schedules. If you want the specific citation for cities, it's OAR-166-200. And that will list, uh, that, that is the general schedule for all Oregon cities. So it doesn't mean that every 
city has to keep every rec record on that schedule list. But if you do hold them in any form, then that's your authorization to destroy them. A couple years ago, we did modernize our OARs related to electronic records retention. And some of those rules included how, how records can be scanned and made accessible uh, rather than the paper version. As far as the ele electronic servers go, what file formats should they be kept in? What kind of security there should there be in the system? How should the system be maintained? But one of the main reasons for updating the rules was to set rules for electronic records management systems, which are a very specific set of software that can help agencies manage their records in, that are born digital for the most part and make it so you don't have to then print anything out or convert them to another form or you know look through file rooms of records to um, provide access to them when they're re requested by courts or the public. And we'll talk a little bit more about ERMSs later in the presentation, but in case you haven't looked at the OAR 166 in the last two years or so, there have been, have been some updates. Okay, we're gonna shift gears a little bit now that we have the legal framework established. We're also gonna talk about how we handle these records that are in our care, in our custody. So what we're all really good at is storing, we're good at creating records, right? And then we're also really good at, um, you know, putting it in a pile somewhere or putting it in folders, dumping it somewhere. So, so we're great at um, storing things, but storage is only a tiny fraction of the battle. What we really need to look at is how are we organizing the records that we're storing so that we can find them again, um, provide access to them when they're requested and ultimately to destroy them when the retention schedule says that they can't be destroyed. Okay, a couple of visuals here on the screen where we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, how records tend to be organized. So for decades and decades, records were stored in centralized file rooms in paper form. So this, this is our, our old, mostly decommissioned state archives file cabinet of all our old projects. So we no longer add to this. We are digitizing these and putting them in our ERMS system so that we don't, so we can get the space back. First of all, we don't have to hold on to all of this paper. But um, typical office file cabinet, it's a bunch of drawers. Each drawer has a whole bunch of file folders in it and the file folders have labels and they have other notation. They're sorted by defined criteria. In this case, it's alphabetically by the name of the agency that we worked with. These are retention schedule files for agencies. And this kind of organization is really how paper records were filed for decades. The basic structure, it makes sense to people. It's second nature for most people who work in any, any kind of office. Now think about this cabinet and then replicate it electronically so that you have nested folders on a shared drive. That's, that's pretty much what happened in the last 20 or 30 years. So you have a network drive that all kinds of people have access to. If there was a gatekeeper to a centralized file room, that person is now gone. Everyone makes up their own file structure and their own naming convention. So the structure pretty quickly uh, gets messed up. Suddenly everyone has the ability to create new folders or new headings whenever we can't find what we want. And as things grow, that's gonna happen very, very often. So there's no longer experts on the file plan or the file structure. And so over time, as new people come on board, maybe training lapses, people forget what certain things, what certain acronyms mean. And this gr slow, gradual slide usually leads to something like this. If we're looking at replicating a paper file structure in a network drive, it's probably gonna look something like this. Um, this pretty much looks like every network file, file share that I've ever seen, and that is not to you know judge anyone who works in them. It's just that network drives are not the optimal way to store public records in a shared environment. It's just because even the most carefully planned file structure will eventually break down without pretty much constant oversight and maintenance. And people are way too busy 
doing their regular jobs to be able to take time out to go tame this wild shared drive. So you can notice some of these file folder titles are acronyms. There's AA, lowercase. There's ADA, uppercase. There's HRD. And then there's my personal favorite, Frank's stuff. So that doesn't really tell you anything about the contents other than Frank was somehow involved. Um, so you can see from the example, and you can probably recognize your own agency shared drive if you still have one from this. You can see a few folders that do make sense given that previously established structure. So there's folders for things like forms and background checks and recruiting. But there's tons of acronyms. You know, someone on their first day is not going to know where to file things. It's not going to make intuitive sense. And pretty much the only way you're going to find a document that you're looking for in this mess is if you already know exactly where it is and you don't mind drilling down through a folder structure. Also, there's probably going to be lots of duplicate content somewhere in this because people really like to stash extra copies of records or make copies of whole directories and file them somewhere else so that they know exactly where to find them. They don't trust any kind of centralized organization anymore. So what we're left with is this network file structure where it's impossible to proactively apply any sort of retention rules to this because the information simply is not organized in a way that makes that possible. And so everything has to be manual. You have to go and find it yourself, and you have to hope that your knowledge of the file folders is, is good enough to get you there. So we don't want things to be manual and electronic. We want it to be automated. We want the electronic systems to do the heavy lifting for us and help us. So there really does have to be a better way to do this. And this is just a, not to put too fine a point on it, what some of these folders can look like if it was too small of a view on the previous slide. Miscellaneous folders uh, always pop up. It doesn't help people find things. The question mark, question mark is another uh, that we've seen a lot in Untitled. No one even took the time to, to name the folder that they created and, and filed documents in. So what do we learn from all of our years of attempting to do this type of records management in, um, in our light speed electronic world that we live in now? A few key lessons that we've come up with, and the first one is we just have to simplify. If you have too many choices of file folders, people are going to refuse to make the choice. And it's kind of human nature. And we've seen studies where if you ask someone to sort things into one of 25 categories, they're just going to look at you like you're crazy. If you give them a dozen choices, they'll probably make a game attempt and then give up. But if you give them five or six, it becomes a fairly easy and routine thing. If you give them a limited number of choices, um, in effect, a functional filing system, which is based on the functions of the agency as the main categories, that really lessens the burden on the employees, and it makes things a lot easier to identify. So once we have functional categories, for example, accounting or payroll, next we need to make identify subcategories to those functions. So underneath accounting, we would probably have one for invoices and a separate category for accounts receivable records. And each of those subcategories matches an entry in the general schedule. And each general schedule entry has its own retention period. So in, in that sense, what we've got is a fairly flat directory structure. At the bottom level are categories that match the retention schedule. And the retention schedule is applied to the folders. So we load our retention schedules into the system. And then once someone puts a document in a certain folder, the system knows how long the contents of that folder need to be kept. And it can easily tell you, based on the metadata date created, for example, on a document, the destruction date for that document. So that uh, is something that can help people when it's time to do your annual purge of your records. It means you don't have to open every file folder in every file cabinet and look at the document and look at its date and make a manual decision on whether it can be destroyed or not. The system already has that information at its 
uh, available and can identify records that can be destroyed. It won't destroy them based without human intervention, but it can identify what is eligible for destruction and make purging a lot more uh, quick, a lot quicker and more efficient. So we want to create folders based on retention periods of like records and to put invoices all in the invoices folder. So we don't want to have forever piles of miscellaneous documents. Probably the, the biggest lesson here is that official records, public records, they all need to be filed in the same central areas. It could be a centralized file room or it could be an electronic system used in common by the entire agency. But what we wouldn't want to have is the 10 employees in our department to all scatter their public records on 10 different personal workstations. Um, that's not a centralized uh, approach, and it means when people need records, they're going to need to somehow get access to those 10 machines. Uh, with 10 people that all probably have their own naming convention and probably have their own unique file structure. So the goal here is really to centralize and to control, to have intellectual control over our records. That means having them in one central location. So extra copies laying around are probably not going to be disposed of properly. You need to make sure that the official copy is the, um, there is version control, that people know which is the latest version and not, you know, draft number two from three weeks ago. So the people aren't relying on those drafts and copies laying around. They're going to the centralized filing system and identifying the latest official copy of a document. And also our personal drives should really only have non-record materials, reference materials, unfinished draft, drafts, um, scratch notes, and things like that that really uh, aren't public records don't meet the definition of public records. So again, the functional filing system has a limited number of categories, so people don't go, get overwhelmed, so that they will actually make the choice to file. The functional filing system is organized by broad functional areas. Like we said, you know, one might be law enforcement, another might be human resources. Within those functional areas, we group them by retention requirements. They're in folders, not just piles of documents that are kept forever. And finally, records go into the same areas, the centralized approach and not into uh, personal folders. So this slide shows you what taking those approaches, the functional filing system, and applying them to that messy old shared drive might look like. So now you can see we actually gave it a naming convention at the top. You can tell this is the human resources administration function. And within that, we've got things like uh, subcategories like benefit records. And within that, we've got categories of records that all have retention periods. In this case, we went ahead and put the retention period on the folder name. Just as a tip, you don't want someone putting very uh, ephemeral short-term records in the 75-year folder, so why not put it there? Um, it's not necessary to do that. And then they further broke them down by year. That makes it a lot simpler sometimes if you have a large volume of records. You can just file them in the uh, appropriate category and then in the year, and then everything in that year folder can usually go away around the same period of time. It makes destruction a little bit simpler. So this slide is what a filing system might look like if we followed our advice. And the, uh, the records are actually the same. That shared drive we were looking at before did contain personnel records. Now it's just a little bit, makes a little bit more rational sense. People can figure out what's going on with this structure. Okay, once you've established uh, your new clean filing system, what is really there to stop us from falling into our bad habits again? Well, a couple things, a well-organized training program and Good unit level procedures are probably going to help, and having cons reaching consensus among employees will help. But usually, what happens is things get busy at work and the practices slip. So, over time, we start to approach this same mess that we had at the beginning. To avoid that, we really need to bring in new tools 
that automate our simple routine decisions and then also lessen our reliance on expecting every single person to do the, the correct thing 100% of the time. So this is where the ERMS, electronic record system, can help us. It can take some of the burden off our employees. So electronic records management system, it can be used to locate and manage not just electronic records, but also paper records as far as uh, the, where they're located. For one example, Secretary of State Audits Division uses our electronic records management system, we call it ORMS, to organize their audit reports. They just drag and drop electronic copies of their audit reports into the correct folder in the system. They can also put email, other research documents in there. And if they don't have electronic documents for, but they do have you know, 10 boxes related to an audit, they can just enter into the system the physical location for where the boxes are stored. So if they search for that audit name or number, they're going to get a list of results, including scanned electronic documents and also the location, physical locations of some of the boxes. The, and so they'll, they'll know exactly where to look for all the records. There aren't five or six systems. There aren't some in paper or some in electronic. If they're public records at our agency, they're meant to be added into our system in one way or another. And that means retrieval can be done by one search in one system rather than having IT look in one place, sending people to the offsite storage to pull boxes, and having everyone search their email. That, that's kind of a recipe for disaster given the volume of records that are coming into our agencies these days. The main reason for ERMS is that manual records management simply doesn't work in our electronic world. There's too much, too much volume. People will, will say, why don't we just go the cheap route and have people do their jobs like they always did in paper? Um, or try to apply those paper processes to electronic records? So there's a lot of evidence to um, reinforce that manual, manual records management just isn't going to work in the electronic world. We create mountains of digital information daily, and even if everyone devoted half their time at work to managing it, we still wouldn't get to it all. To accommodate this huge volume of records, there are really no physical reminders that, that spur us into action. You know, a while back, we probably have all of our project folders in paper in file folders on our desk, and we could tell when it got you know, to our eye level, it was really time to do something about all of that stuff. And so it was kind of a reminder, reminding us to do something uh, right in front of our eyes. But nowadays, we just create another folder on our desktop or in our shared drive. There's no reminder. You can easily ignore that kind of stuff forever. We also create huge numbers of duplicate copies or electronic information, and a lot of it is simply uncontrolled. If we just think about every time that we collaboratively work on a document with a large group of people, you probably recognize that you're emailing documents back and forth constantly. Hey, what do you think of this draft? How many versions are there going to be of these documents? So what happens now is instead of one document, we've got a whole slew of documents that we have to manage for every specific document. And it's really impossible to reliably make sure you destroyed all the copies when it's time. So security also gets a lot tougher when you have to apply rules to so many different silos of information. There are always going to be lapses. And in that case, your agency could be put at risk, legal risk, or financial risk. Without centralized control of information, it's a lot harder to find and produce it when you're facing legal discovery requests or public records requests from the public. So the times that you have to spend looking for those records, the lawyer fees, the redaction fees, they can all really add up. And then finally, electronic records, they need pretty constant monitoring over time to ensure that they're going to stay accessible and readable. Our file formats do change a lot. And what's working for us today might not work in 10 or even five years from now. We really need to understand what we hold, what information we hold to be able to prepare for the future. And an ERMS system is going to allow us to track all of our information uh, f with a single search. So what options do government agencies in Oregon have regarding their electronic records management system? 
agencies are allowed to select their own system, provided it meets the requirements in OAR 166 Division 17, uh, the slide we looked at earlier. And especially important is any ERMS selected by an agency must be certified to meet the U.S. Department of Defense 5015.2 standard. It's a standard for electronic record keeping systems. This standard ensures security and interoperability and portability of data stored within systems. And software that is not DOD certified uh, is not approved for permanent storage of government records. So there's no mandate for an agency to acquire one of these systems, but if you do acquire one, it needs to be on the DOD 5015 list, uh, product registry list. Agencies in Oregon have the unique opportunity to join our, our statewide ERMS system, uh, again, called ORMS, a public-private partnership that is facilitate, facilitated between State Archives and Shavs Consulting in Baker City, Oregon. So it's a software as a service model, a government, private government cloud where agencies pay a monthly subscription fee and then they're able to implement that ERMS without the significant infrastructure costs associated with a standalone system. They also get the benefit of state archive staff and we help people organize and manage their records proactively and conduct training at people's desks on the best ways to use the software. At the moment, I think it's about 60 state and local government agencies part of ORMS from the smallest school district and special district up to larger uh, courts, cities, counties, and state agencies. All right, to shift gears again, we're gonna talk a little bit about modern technologies for record keeping, including the old shoe phone. The main, uh, probably, uh, technology that people use, uh, we're gonna talk about is email, which is hardly new. It's been around since the 60s, but by the 90s, it was something everyone was using for pretty much all their business communications. Um, that's pretty much 25 years of ever-increasing percentage of business communications using this platform. So you'd think by now we'd have all the answers right in our palm of our hand, right? But Unfortunately, email systems are not really meant for long-term storage of records. They really should be moved out of the email system. Email systems were designed as you know, an ephemeral contrivance for most of its life. They weren't seen as important records. And a lot of people in government and business were very hesitant to treat it as a proper record-keeping technology for a really long time. So as a result, we still struggle with just how to deal with all of these business communications that are sent by email. So some of the issues with email are, again, exploding volume. Every year, the number of email correspondence increases and the percentage that spam also increases every year. So need to talk about uh, some of the other drawbacks that, uh, that it has. As a, as a format. How long our emails are kept often depend on external factors. Uh, IT shops run out of server space and say it's time to destroy, start destroying email. We're at our quota. Well, technically emails are public records that can only be destroyed on the authority of a retention schedule. So there's a little bit of a conflict there. IT policies uh, might be in conflict with records management policies. A lot, but not all, of your email will fall under public record, especially if they're duplicates, or if you're just CC'd or something on it, or if it's reference material, those would not fall under public record. And also there's this question of how long are we supposed to keep emails? And state archives cannot make a blanket statement about that, unfortunately, since the content of the conversations, the content of the email message itself is going to determine its, con its retention, not its format. So there have been some government agencies that, for example, said, we're gonna keep all our email 60 days and then destroy it. Well, not a good idea because, uh, you know, legally, 
uh, binding contracts are in the statute as being kept six years after expiration of contract. If, you're, if it was sent in an email and you destroyed it after 60 days, uh, there's gonna be a problem. So email again is a communications transmission medium, but it's not meant to be a long-term storage, storage solution. So attached documents in emails might be records as well. And you really need to make sure that you keep the body of the message that transmitted that attachment along with the attachment itself. Otherwise, it's not gonna make sense if you say, hey, see this attachment for details and the attachment is not readily available. The amount of email that we have to deal with really means we need practical solutions for managing it because it's often very difficult to classify the content or identify who keeps the official copy of it. One thing Secretary of State has done is designate the sender of email as the official copy holder. And that means if I send an email to 20 people, they don't have to keep 20 copies. We just uh, make sure that, you know, if you send the email, you're responsible for filing it and making sure it's in our ERMS system and managed according to the correct, correct retention requirements. We also want people to know what not to keep because like I said, there are exemptions to public records law. Uh, if I email a friend, let's go to lunch, and they said, yeah, let's go out. Those might be on a work email system, but they, unless they deal with work-related matters, they can probably safely be destroyed. Um, they're not, they don't meet the definition of a public record. And spam also falls under that. FYIs fall on, under that, listserv messages or event announcements, as long as you don't reply to them, probably do not fall under the definition of public record. Definitely not spam, definitely not unsolicited advertisements. Or personal correspondence, or hey, here's a newspaper clipping from the Oregonian that mentions us. Those are not technically public records either. It's good for an agency to know who's responsible for keeping it. In our case, we designated the sender. And if it's something that I receive from a member of the public and I'm the first contact listed on that email, then as the, reci as the first recipient of that email uh, from an external sender, I also have the official copy of that. So find out if your, oops. check to see if your IT department automatically empties deleted items. And if not, you should make sure that you do that periodically because emails in that trash folder are still discoverable and may have to be turned over in a public records request. If it exists, it can be disclosable. It, it might have to be handed over if it exists in any form. And if they are allowed to be deleted, if they've met their retention period, make sure to follow through in a timely manner. Also, finally, do yourself and everyone you work with a favor. Make really detailed and useful subject lines. An email with the subject, you know, meeting or hello can easily get confused with other emails. And then you might remember it for about a day and then in six months and you have a whole pile of non-descriptive subject lines, you're gonna have no idea. You're gonna have to just open every single one and look at each one and classify it then. But instead of just saying meeting, if you title the subject line something like follow up to April 12th meeting about records management, then you're gonna have a much better idea what that message is about. It's gonna be a lot easier to locate it. Uh, later down the road. A couple more tips about email. Uh, frequently purge your deleted items if there isn't already a policy on it. S useful specific subject lines. And then state archives are proponents of the cleanup tool, which is in Outlook 2010 and later, which allows you to right click on a folder. And hit the, if you hit that cleanup, which is on this slide here, then it will go through and identify uh, duplicate material and tag them for deletion. I'm thinking of if a colleague and I go back and forth and we, we have six emails in this thread. The sixth and final email is gonna have all of the previously quoted email and all the content and all the metadata. So the sixth one is really the only one you need to keep and it will weed out the previous five and mark them for deletion. You do wanna be careful that any attachment that is sent back and forth is also retained because it might not be retained in, the, in that last version. 
topic a lot of people talk about these days um, because agencies are moving towards it is social media, which has, as you can guess, its whole, it also applies, to, can be applied to public records law, but has um, unique challenges. Is social media public record? So again, does the content meet the public records definition that we looked at earlier from ORS 192? Is this content unique? Is its retention based on the content and the function of the record? So what this means is if you post something to fa Facebook or Twitter on your public agency site and it doesn't exist anywhere else internally or on a network drive, then you might have Facebook, for example, could have the only official copy of that record. And so what you really want to do is identify records that might not be kept uh, internally on agency equipment and uh, try to rectify that. We'll talk about that more in a second. So managing, there's no requirement, by the way, for Oregon agencies to, to leap into social media. Um, sometimes they, they do it to engage better with the public. And in that case, a lot have had a lot more success in dealing with it more as a one-way street or in things like disabling comments on, on certain things because if they're inviting the public to comment and the public comments it on Facebook or Twitter, it could, it could conceivably be considered a public comment that would fall under public records law. So before any agency starts to use any social media platform, it really needs to have written policies and procedures that address records use, records access, records retention, and records ownership. Records ownership meaning the agency owns an Instagram feed, for an example, for example, and that Instagram feed contains public records that are being managed according to public records law. So every agency should have a policy and it really needs to have a plan for capturing content posted to those social media platforms, preferably by um, not having Twitter or Facebook or YouTube be the official copy, but to have, um, have a copy of that somewhere under the agency's control. And you can capture that content either with built-in mechanisms. Twitter, for example, does have a pretty good way to export everything that you tweet. There's also external software that can be purchased that will make copies of everything that you post to social media and help you save it locally. But again, like we said, there's no requirement for any agency to, to use one or any, any of these social medias. Text messages, instant messages, chat rooms, things like that. So who holds these kinds of messages? It's probably not the agency. It's probably the carrier or the ISP. And how long do they keep them? Nobody can really, can really guess. They might have a policy, but it's definitely not gonna be as long as our retention schedules say. Um, it might be 30 days. It might be slightly longer, but you do not wanna rely on a private company to hold on to records as long as it says in your retention schedule. So our, our specific agency, we strongly recommend against using text messages that are on third-party vendors for you know, detailed or public record material. Um, our policy is this one in quotes here, and Secretary of State's policy is substantive businesses substantive business related discussions rather are not to take place on text message sms or other mobile messaging applications so if i'm running late for a meeting or i'm meeting a colleague i might just say stuck in traffic be 10 minutes late you know that's not really substantive what i wouldn't want to do is launch into a long discussion of all the topics we need to talk about at today's meeting that would probably fall under public records and what i should really be doing instead of texting it is using my uh, work account for that it's going to capture that and keep it for the retention period if i'm just tapping it out on my phone on a third party mobile um, device or app or social media, it's, it's probably not going to capture it for the time period that it needs to be. So there are some cases where policy really isn't enough and you just have to use mobile messaging. So after the fact, you can manually forward those messages back to your government email account. 
And some services do allow you to auto CC that account on all your messages, on all your outgoings, so that, that will accomplish that as well. There's also uh, mobile device management that can centralize control um, of what's, what's happening on a phone, whether it's a personal phone or an agency issued phone. So I was just going to close out today by uh, a quick discussion of some of these overarching issues we're, that we're dealing with. We've already talked about email and social media and mobile. and. That's what we're talking about today, but they're not necessarily going to be the same communication technologies in use tomorrow. We as a society, we're always playing catch up with new technologies, even though the core issues remain the same in every new iteration of the technology. So what we really need to do is stop jumping into the new technology because it's new and only later saying, hey, what about the records created by these new technologies? Here's what we recommend doing. Always make records part of this initial discussion, no matter how seemingly ephemeral that technology is going to be, because almost any kind of technology can create records. And if it does, um, it can be a major issue if you never thought about that eventuality uh, in advance. It's a great idea to think about the entire life cycle of the records as well, as well as the acceptable use of it. And to think about, in terms of the life cycle of the record, how long are these records going to live in this format or on this platform? What's the retention of the records that we're going to be putting there? Do we have or do we even need a capture strategy? If something meets the definition of a public record, the answer is yes, you do need to have a capture strategy. So what we hope to do is get people thinking about these issues before uh, the technology becomes prevalent and before it's too late to, you know, uh, head off issues with that might happen with that. It's great to have conversations between legal, IT, administrative services, and also records officer, records management personnel before uh, purchasing any new information system, any new software, because you'll want to get uh, everyone's heads together and talk about that before you purchase anything new. I am happy to take questions. My contact information is up top here. I'm Matt, and Chris, whose information is also here, is our ORMS administrator. He's happy to uh, take questions or request for information about the ORMS system, which again is the ERMS system in use at Secretary of State. Thanks, everybody.